They came to try and take my toilet paper and tendies. They know not who they trifle with. Journal Entry 202 We made it to Zebron. I first took to be a really weird mountain. Well, it was a massive volcano at some point. They carved the entire thing into a giant spire and hollowed it out. It only has one main entrance gate that's large enough to fit a village in and has a series of massive mechanical doors. I believe I could call this an arcology or a hive city. All internal lighting is almost all done through light shafts and mirrors and timed with the sun's movements and seasons through the use of mechanical devices. At night, or places that the sunlight can't get to, they use thick glass pipes pumping some kind of glowing liquid that's also part of the forge cooling system. It gives the whole place an otherworldly feel to it. It uses geothermal heating to keep them warm in the winter and massive ventilation system to keep it cool in the summer. It houses several million doors. I didn't even know construction on this scale this large was possible. This is truly a world wonder. The interior, the parts I've seen anyways, are all inlaid marble and red granite. Etchings decorating nearly every surface. It has a massive underground where most of the dwarven smithing is done using lava powered and specialized magic powered forges. Most of the minerals they need are mined from the area which is supposedly one of the most mineral rich locations in the continent. So what do they do when the volcano decides it's time to erupt? Apparently they claim to have control of the situation through generations of specialized geomantic wizards and sorcerers. We are currently at one of the inns on the 13th floor. We have a balcony with a fantastic view. We are also now out of money. Journal Entry 203 Well, Marcus has been doing the bar thing for money while the rest of us have made our plan. We poked around looking for a word of a human wizard with at least three humans, slaves, or minions. The place is so big it may take a while. Nothing yet, but there are quite a few wizards. We ruled out the geomancers first since they were the most obvious group. But they're all dwarves and don't have slaves. The locals frown the whole concept but it's considered legal as long as no public or obvious torture is going on. The next obvious target was a small wizard school in the upper levels. They didn't know anything about it. Jason decided to check in with the thieves guild after he managed to find it. Avery was going to risk asking at the sun god temple, but there wasn't one. There is only one religion in the dwarf kingdom, the dwarf god. The god of hard work, alcohol, and sex. It took me a few minutes to figure out why he covered such an odd assortment of beliefs, but they all lead to each other. Hard work is rewarded with alcohol, which leads to sloppy drunken sex apparently. Speaking of which, we all took bets on whether or not Marcus would bet a dwarf girl. By the time we got back to the inn come nightfall, it had already happened. God damn it Marcus. Next bet is on what Marcus won't sleep with. Journal Entry 204 the city is pretty damn intimidating. Aside from it being so big for a world such as this, it's all the people. It's an empathic overload if I let my defenses down. It's almost as if I could lose myself. Anyways, we continued on our search. Went through the inns and taverns looking for any information and found none. Right when we were about to give up for the day, Jason spotted something. Graffiti scratched into the wall, recent and in English help. We know we're in the right place now. We scoured the level. The only thing we came up with was an archmage no one knows anything about. We found his residence, but I'm completely blocked from feeling anything inside. We went back to gather our gear, grab Marcus and prepare. This could go badly. Journal Entry 205 well, I knocked on the door, and this plain looking guy in his 40s answers. He seemed annoyed for this first split second, and then there was something in his eyes. I unleashed hell. He had enough mental fortitude to hold me back, but could barely move. He starts doing the motions almost in slow motion when Jason slipped past and socked him in the face. That gave me enough distraction to lock him up. We pushed him inside and closed the door. Mike and Jason started checking rooms while the rest of us sat him down in a chair. 
Avery bound his hands, the last started appealing through his mind. Sure enough, he's the one. So what has he been doing with our friends? He's been using them for extra planner experimentation. I can't make heads or tails of what he's trying to accomplish, but I don't know wizardry. I do know that he hasn't had any success so far. To make matters worse, he's got a buddy that shows up occasionally for organic samples that he can use for some kind of monster research. Why does he need their samples specifically? We're the same as the local humans, right? So Jason comes running back saying he found them. They're in some kind of magic stasis. That's when everything that could go wrong did. There's a sudden blur in the room. The Rheingraf spymaster suddenly appears out of fucking nowhere and makes a lunge for me? Now, really, I was completely caught off guard and take a sword to the gut. Before he can land the killing blow, Avery blasts the shit out of him with her holy light and Jason buries his blade in his lungs. Then poof, he's gone. Avery manages to get me stabilized and my wounds closed. By this time, the now very confused Archmage is freeing himself and is throwing up his magic defenses. I'm struggling to get on my feet. The ghost pains of being stabbed are still nearly debilitating to me. Mike comes running out of a side room and just throws down with the Archmage. Fire, explosions, lightning all over the fucking place. Destroying everything. Jason drags me to a side room long enough to get back on my feet. Avery sticks with Mike and does her best adding in her own defenses. Marcus is throwing around his barred magic. I hand Jason my gun and send him off while I'm getting on my feet. I finally get back out there. I can't dominate him anymore, not with his defenses up, but I can throw distractions at him. We all manage to bring the fucker down and collapse in a pile. Then we realize half the room is on fire, so he ran around putting that out. The Archmage is still alive, but he's out of the fight. I take the opportunity to dive in and start erasing his spells from his mind, something I should have done the first fucking place. Everyone's exhausted from the exertion. Jason hands me back my gun and we tie up the Archmage again. This time we cocoon him in the fucking rope. Then we went on to see about the others. So a few rooms over we have a lab. Sure enough, there they are, Ian, Max, and Austin. They're just floating there half naked in the blue light coming from some magic circle on the floor made of salt and blood. We pull them out of it and they start breathing again but they're unconscious. We set them down, and I take a very careful look at their mental states. Their recent memories pretty fragmented from coming in and out of stasis for whatever reasons. Beyond that, the last full memories were their trip here and being questioned endlessly by the Archmage before being magically dominated and used in a few minor rituals and then shoved in stasis. Their emotional states are overwhelming. They're shit terrified and have no idea what's going on. I tried doing some memory editing to help in their recovery once they awake. We move them into the Archmage's bedroom and are letting them rest for now. Journal Entry 206 They finally woke up. It took a good half hour. They didn't recognize us right away. It took a lot to calm them down. We did our best to explain what's been going on. Cooked up something for them to eat from the Archmage's kitchen and got them some clothes to wear. Jason and Marcus ransacked a place for valuables, including his spell books. I got a lot of blame for leaving them, but deep down they know he couldn't have done anything. I wasn't going to fight about it. It was time to get out of this place. We all decided to go to the only city we had felt safe at, Alien. Then there is the problem of the Archmage. What do we do with him? Mike calls Dibs and dragged him back to the lab and began setting up for some kind of infernal ritual. When did he learn to do that? He asked not to be disturbed and closed the door. Avery didn't even object. There were some disturbing sounds and then it was over. No sign of the Archmage was left other than his shadow burning to the wall. We're currently waiting at the inn. Jason and Marcus are selling everything they looted and would be seen about getting the hell out of here. Journal Entry 207 We've got a pretty decent amount of money on hand now. I purchased tickets for 10 by airship. We leave tomorrow. 
We're heading along in the other direction and should arrive in Manon in two days. From there we go to Nespedax, Anfield, and from there we should be back in Hebrew. I'm not sure where the Hebrew airship goes, since its route with Wolf Lake was broken, but hopefully Ashvale are directed to Aiden. I hope the other three are ready for this. They haven't had the travel experience that we have had. They can't even read common yet. Mike offered a two to them. We did return what electronics were salvaged at the Rosenbridge Advisor's place. Ian teared up when the first song was MP3 player came on. They have a hard road ahead of them. I hope they're up for the task. Either way, we'll be there for them. Journal Entry 208 Airship Travel I'm starting to get used to it. Back home, I'd even been on a plane since the 80s. Here I am, using airships to get everywhere. Austin gave everyone an hour-long rant on how impossible a flying boat is from an aerodynamic perspective. Yeah, <laughs> we know. Now that they're not scared out of their minds, we went over our adventures again with them. I let them read the journal. They were pretty shocked at what we've done, especially Max. I think they understand, though. The biggest question in their minds, however, was how we are doing magic. We're from a non-magic world. Even I'm not sure how to explain it. Each of us does it differently. I figure it's because it's the world or dimension or whatever, and not genetic since we're just regular humans. That isn't a suitable explanation though. Psionics isn't something you anyone can learn and neither is sorcery. Anyways, we watch Strange Days. It's still new to those three. Journal Entry 209 Welcome to Mandan. Not so much a city as a village, and just a pass through on the trade circuit. Legends say that this is the first organized settlement of mankind, hence Manden. Currently it's an elven city. Why? Some old territory war a hundred years ago. The city is half wood A-frame houses and the other half is stone building more common with dwarven construction. It borders on a forest from one side and a few miles from the other seems to start turning into a desert. Beyond the sandy waste is apparently another civilization that rarely makes contact, but is where the recurve bow comes from. Interesting. Anyways, we're on a layover until sunrise, and then head out to Nespedax. Took a walk around town with Ian. He's particularly depressed, especially upon hearing how we've had no success in trying to figure out how to get back home, and have more or less given up. Well, I found out the reason. He's recently married and his wife was pregnant when he left. The child would have been born by now. That is fucking depressing. So why did he come? Well, the same reason I did. We weren't entirely in control. Some kind of hypnotic pull. He may well have ended up bringing his wife with him if she was home at the time. I wonder who else left someone behind when we came here. No one's been particularly talkative about their life back home because we're reminded and it starts to hurt. Better to focus on the here and the now. Journal Entry 210 Well, this sucks. We were on our way to Nespedax when the airship suffered some kind of engine or magic failure. We made a soft crash in the woods and the ship's officer has been working his ass off while the rest of us are watching out for hungry monsters, curious animals, or bandits. The hull took some minor damage which the crew have been fixing but we did get drafted into knocking down some trees to clear the landing space up. We're not getting a ticket discount for this either, I asked. All part of the adventure, the captain says, as long as it doesn't lead to another fucking barbarian hunt. The artificer says we'll be back in the air in two hours. He said that four hours ago, we're going to be stuck here for the night. Sucks. Journal Entry 211 Something woke me up in the middle of the night. Strong aggression out in the wilds. Before I could alert the duty guards, we came under attack. Knowles, a scout party of five. They were feral. The alert was sent, and everyone come stumbling out from below decks and the fight for the airship began. We outnumbered them, but they were prepared. We managed to put them down with some minor injuries, and the artificer got his ass back to work. Max got an arrow through his hand, and Avery's working on that. She's having some trouble healing these wounds. The gnolls apparently smeared their weapons with something. The captain says it's feces. Fucking fantastic. We broke out the anti-disease necklace and are hoping that will help. 
Austin seems to have some actual medical training and has been cleaning out wounds with some of the crew's alcohol. It burns like a motherfucker. Journal Entry 212 we managed to get back in the air and we're in Espadax. Avery's been periodically checking on our wounds to make sure nothing goes bad. Max got use of his hand back, but it's a little puffy, even with the wound closed. So, Nespedax, one of the larger trade hubs on the circuit. This city is pretty racially mixed for an actual kingdom. The buildings are mostly wood and plaster with thatched roofing. Its main export is mineral wealth from a series of mines which flows southeastward. Sebron's middle exports flow southwest along the trade circuit. We're set up in the inn for the night. Unfortunately, there's no airship going to our next stop, Ainfield. We'll have to make do traveling with the trade caravan on foot. I hope Max, Ian, and Austin are up for the task. Journal Entry 213. We kind of lucked out. We hooked up with a trade caravan hauling iron and copper, and we're getting paid to guard it. Three of us lack weapons, so they're to stay with the caravan if we get attacked. Our trip should take four days through the plains. No known barbarian tribes out here, so that's a relief. Max keeps asking me for my gun, since I already have a sword. I'm not giving him my gun. He should have brought his own gun. So we're all chatting away while on our long walk, when suddenly it gets out that Marcus has been sleeping with non-humans. Ian flips his shit about it calling it bestiality and all that. Won't go near him. Marcus gave him the any port in a storm response and they've been arguing about it ever since. Like there's not enough to deal with already. Journal Entry 214 We came upon a broken down caravan today. We had a short standoff until we could prove that we weren't hostile and they the same. Their caravan guards were tribal lizard people. Pretty unusual. Their axle brace or something snapped and were stranded. Our caravan leader decided we should help out. None of us Terrans had a clue how to fix it, so we stood around and chatted with the other caravan guards. The lizards. They're a distrustful bunch, and after some poking around, I could see why. They aren't treated very well by the other civilized races, but most of the tribal groups aren't. This group has been doing the Nespedax to Ainfield run to bring in money for their tribe, and keep doing it because they're searching for someone, one of their own that ran off. They wouldn't say why they're after this one, but I sensed that he was an important figure in the tribe, so it's not like an escaped criminal or exile. I noticed that while Max and Austin were initially distressed at dealing with big armed lizard people, they eventually warmed up to them. Ian stayed pretty cold towards them the whole time. Anyways, it took a good five hours to get the other cart fixed. They had to make a new one out of new wood, which meant cutting down a tree and cutting it down and all that pain in the ass. Journal Entry 215. Welcome to Ainfield, one of the main distribution hubs on the circuit. No airship port unfortunately. What they do have is two rivers that split off and head in different directions and are being used as trade routes. The city is an all wood building with a wood stake all around it. Their main export used to be wood, but the area has been clear cut. Now it's just a distribution hub that would probably cease to exist a second trade stopped. From here, we'll jump a riverboat to Hebri and see where their airship can get us. Avery and I had a long talk with Ian about his racial issues. Yeah, he's a little racist and he's having trouble adapting because of it. I can't exactly dive in and fix it, so that's something he's going to have to get used to on his own time, I guess. Anyways, the booze is cheap here, so we're all getting hammered at the tavern and we're leaving in the morning. Journal Entry 216 we had a minor emergency this morning. We couldn't find Austin for a few hours. He turned up in an alley with its clothes strewn all over. Luckily, he didn't take any of his stuff with him when he wandered off for this. Avery cleared up some of his hangover and we went off to get ready. Apparently, he decided to try and drink himself home and may have had sloppy drunken sex with a local or tried to or something. We're pretty sure he wasn't prostituting himself anyways. At least we hope. That's Marcus's job. So we're on a boat trip. It's pretty relaxing so far. It's a river junk loaded with cargo from other cities heading for Hebrew. It should take a day and a half depending on the weather. I've taken up fishing off the side with a rod that the crew lent me. I'm totally cheating and tricking the fish into biting. It's just not as satisfying though it is pretty funny. Journal Entry 217 Ah, Hebrew. 
It's been a month or two since we've been here. The place has a kind of an old Italian Mediterranean feel to it. When we arrived, a fair was in full swing, so we joined in the festivities. Some town founding celebration, a cook-off, some booze testing, dancing, and games. Marcus got on stage and played some U2 for a bit. The locals didn't seem to mind, so whatever. We had fun. It seemed that our three newbies finally managed to unwind and have a good time. Picked up some gossip in town. There's been retreating tribals coming up from the trade road from Wolf Lake on a regular basis. First shifters, then wild elves, always in small groups. In response, he set up a border patrol and are building a manned guard fort, anticipating inbound undead eventually. They've been petitioning all churches trying to get more help in, but it takes a while for messages to get around. In other news, Winterfield has been sacked by the Barbarians, and they've been cut off completely. Their new airship trader has been skipping over them and going directly to Brightly until things get under control. None of the other nations wanted to get involved since it was a problem that could have been dealt with but was ignored by the king until he was disposed of. Journal Entry 218 Where to begin? While Marcus and Austin were out seeing about airship travel, I was sitting in the town square watching them clean up after the festival and checking over some things in my journal when some elf girl, young looking, early teens maybe, it's hard to tell with them. Anyways, she walks up and stops, then starts looking over my shoulder. She can fucking read English. Kind of. I grabbed her and made her start talking. Almost got the attention of the guards and I scared the shit out of her. So several generations back, some human got mixed on her family tree and they've been learning this mysterious language as tradition ever since and have even deployed it as a secret code in family business, one of the wineries. All their recipes and anything else they don't want anyone else to read is done up in rudimentary English. She's off trying to set up a meeting with one of the elder family members who may have been alive back then. I've gathered up everyone and we're going to check in once we get word back. Oh yeah. Airship news. The Hebrew airship isn't going anywhere right now since Wolf Lake is kind of out of the loop now. I'll see if I can convince them to hit Alien or Asheville later, after we're done with this more important stuff. Journal Entry 219. We got our appointment and went to meet with his family. Well, one of them anyway. The sister of the woman who married the human. The actual wife had died a century ago due to some kind of magic plague running through the area at the time. So around 400 years ago, her sister falls for a human, and they get married. Eric Lewis, a druid. He claimed he was from a far off land with strange ways and stranger magic. She didn't know much more about his past. She hadn't cared at the time it was against the union. He did introduce some new kind of fermentation method which they still employ. He settled down on the winery and worked, had kids and eventually died of old age. Well, at least someone had their happily ever after. She didn't have much more to offer, aside from that. Journal Entry 220 Alright, didn't get as much information as would have liked out of that meeting, but it was something. It also means that there may not be a way back home if everyone settled and lived their lives here. So Marcus and I paid a visit to the airship captain. We started some negotiations and managed to convince her about the possible profit of starting a trade room between Alien or Asheville and Hebrew since they've both been cut off since Wolf Lake's sudden undead isolation. She needs to talk it up with her crew and then we'll see if we can hitch a ride. If not, we'll have to take the long way around, through the wild lake to Brightly Route, or we could go on foot across undead infested Wolf Lake to kill Nid. No, that's not going to happen. In other news, I think Ian is starting to adapt. I saw him holding a conversation with a half-orc girl. No agitation coming from either of them, so that's something. And that ends this episode of Stranded in Fantasy. As always, my little duckies, be sure to subscribe to Neckbeardia and click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. As well, be sure to visit the Reddit page, the Discord, and always comment down below in the section for comments and tell us what you think, your own stories, and any dumb shit y'all feel like putting in there. Y'all are pretty good at that, I think. This has been Guard Bro, 
and I will see you next time.